Welcome to the PCN Capital Preview. I'm Francine Scherzer. Today we'll talk about the House legislative agenda. But first, we're joined by Jackson White, reporter from Lancaster Online. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Last week, House Republicans introduced a package of anti-crime bills. What's included in the package? Uh, so last week, what they introduced was what they said uh, would address prevention of crime. Um, so there was two bills. Uh, the first one would really uh, create an advisory committee at uh, the PA Commission on Crime and Delinquency uh, to promote the uh, local crime stopper programs. Um, I know in Lancaster we have one, and um, it's run by citizen volunteers, and they're working to uh, reward anonymous police tipsters. Um, so that was one that was uh, introduced by State Rep. Craig Williams of Delaware County. Um, and the second one that was introduced last week um, it was introduced by Rep. Valerie Gatos of Allegheny County. Um, it would establish a statewide framework uh, for launching neighborhood watch programs, and it would also provide for training of those volunteers uh, with local law enforcement agencies. You wrote that the FBI's uniform crime reporting data shows a 10.3 percent decrease in violent crime nationally from the first six months of 2024 compared to last year. What's the impetus for this focus on crime legislation now? Um, so what lawmakers were saying is that those uh, statistics from the FBI aren't accurate. Uh, Craig Williams actually called them one of the, quote, great fallacies um, and said that people are under-reporting under crimes out of fear of facing retaliation, of having their names on those crime reports. Um, so that's what they say it is. Um, right now, though, crime is a major part of this presidential election, and it seems to be trickling down into these local races. Uh, the two sponsors, uh, Williams and Gatos, are both in kind of contested races, uh, been outlined by multiple media outlets as ones to watch this year. Uh, so I think the fact that they're introducing these week by week, um, this week they just introduced another wave of those bills. And I, I think those line up well with the election. Yeah, if I could just follow up on that, um, you noted a report in Spotlight PA suggesting House Democrats see both Representative Williams and Gato's seats as being vulnerable. Is there a political agenda? Uh, I think it's clear that Addressing these crime waves are an important part of what the Republicans view as their re-election tactics this year. Um, I think on both sides, too, the Democrats are starting to embrace that. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's clear that there's 100 a, <laughs> percent an agenda here to do it, because crime has been a focus of the Republican caucus for some time now. Um, but I think the timing of it, doing it right now, might be to help score a couple of political points heading into Election Day for some of their candidates. Can you give some examples about how other candidates perhaps have utilized crime or crime prevention um, politically as part of their agenda in their candidacies? I mean, I think the biggest one that we can see is uh, former President Donald Trump. Um, he's consistently attacking Vice President Kamala Harris, saying that she's too soft on crime, that she didn't do enough when she was District Attorney of San Francisco or Attorney General of California. Um, and I think those attacks are trickling down. I mean, um, House Minority Leader Brian Cutler in the press conference said that House Democrats have taken a position that is easy on crime. Um, but I think former President Trump is the most obvious one. I think if, if anybody has seen any advertisements on TV or any mailers in their mailbox, uh, they're consistently saying that Democrats are soft on crime or not doing enough to address it. The House only has a handful of session days uh, that remain scheduled till the end of session. What's the likelihood that this package of bills sees any sort of legislative consideration before they run out of time for this session? Especially considering that Democrats control the chamber very slim. Um, but even if House Republicans were in charge, I, I do think it would be slim still. Uh, the lawmakers in the press conference addressed that fact and said that they're introducing these now and also plan on reintroducing them at the start of the next session as soon as they can. Jackson White, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. More of the PCN Capital Preview after this short break. Welcome back. Today we're joined by Representative Brian Cutler, House Minority Leader. We anticipate hearing from Representative Matt Bradford a little bit later in the program as well. Now, Representative, this is an election year. Um, the House and Senate, or the House is uh, close. Democrats have 102 seats. Republicans hold 101. 
What issues are most important to your constituents as they're going to the polls to consider who, who they want to represent them? Well, obviously, you know, being out in the community, holding events and things, we've heard a whole host of issues. Uh, but consistently at the top is inflation and the economy and jobs, followed very close by crime and public safety. So, you know, we have offered a series of amendments and bills in those areas. Uh, we'll continue to do that with an eye towards retaking the majority in the fall. And, you know, that's really ultimately, I think, what people want to talk about. I think they're less concerned about partisan politics and some of you know, the traditional hot button issues and they're really just concerned about what are the impacts on daily life and the truth is while everybody focuses at the presidential level and that garners a lot of interest it's the decisions that are in Harrisburg and at your local level that probably impact your life the most. Democrats currently hold the majority if Republicans were to gain a seat or two and take the majority what shift do you think issue wise would would our viewers see the most well I think right out of the gate you would see a, a series of bills focused on the economy uh, and you know quite frankly some of the initiatives that the governor himself campaigned on regarding uh, true permitting reform uh, you know, some tax improvements as well and then also the crime uh, we have a, a four pillar package it deals with prevention policing prosecution and punishment uh, we've been holding a series of press conferences in that world and continue to, you know, look at those issues because they are so important and come up so consistently. Tell us a little bit more about that uh, anti-crime package that was just recently introduced. Well, we just rolled it out, uh, stage one, if you will, um, on Monday. Uh, we had a follow-up on Tuesday, and then I believe that there's another event coming here today. But they really focus on those ideas. You know, one of the things, uh, if you look at the FBI statistics, uh, they will indicate, you know, roughly that general crime is down. But the truth is, there's a lot of crime that's not being reported. So, you know, that a lot of that actually comes from non-prosecution. Obviously, that was an issue specific to Philadelphia and some of the larger urban centers. Um, and, you know, we will continue to focus on that and giving the police and the prosecutors the tools that they need. Is there any particular data or uh, act activities uh, that served as an impetus to offer this, this package of bills at this time? Well, I think if anybody just watches the news, uh, or unfortunately, even if you know you, you you can see the increased crime here, even here in Harrisburg, uh, we've seen the roving motorcycle gangs and things taking over the streets of Philadelphia, and it's unfortunate. Uh, I think people want to live in peace. They want to live in harmony. They want to be able to go safely f to school, to work, uh, and currently there's a large concern that that's just not possible. So the first wave of bills that were introduced focus on neighborhood watch and community crime stopper programs. These are established programs in some regions. What would these bills do to enhance those programs? Well, uh, you know, Representative Gados and Representative Williams had those two bills, uh, and they spoke about the need to make sure that the volunteers are properly trained, they have the, uh, the appropriate um, knowledge in order to not act with bias or anything uh, that might impact their decision making. Uh, but the truth is, we don't really need to reinvent the wheel. Many of the things that we're talking about have been around for some time and will continue, uh, you know, to push going forward. Where are these bills in the legislative process right now? Uh, they're currently out for co-sponsorship, and I expect them to kind of be stuck in committee given the, the low number of days yet prior to the election. I'd like to shift our focus just a little bit now. Um, uh, one issue that was addressed during the state budget, but we still continue to hear about, is transportation funding. Um, at a recent House transportation hearing, uh, the SEPTA, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Mass Transit Agency, um, suggested that they may have to increase costs or cut services if they don't receive additional funding. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I know that there was a one-time infusion of cash that was in this most recent budget, and I think that Leader Bradford and I would agree that transportation is a, a big issue. Uh, it's one that we tackled about a decade ago with the fuel tax, but the truth is that inflation and, quite frankly, some of our other governmental policies, you know, as we increase fuel standards on cars and we have electric vehicles, uh, that takes money out of the pot and we actually end up paying less tax per mile traveled and you know increasing cost of goods coming back to inflation and the high cost of energy you know we've seen gas prices more than double in the last four years and one of the challenges there obviously is it, it does impact driving habits and you know, specific to SEPTA and the transportation. Uh, and it's important to recognize that there is mass transit in all of our urban centers, uh, and they've all been cutting routes for some time. Uh, I think we have to have a real discussion about a partnership not just at the state level, but the local level, and then at the ridership level, you know, what do those fares look like? Uh, because those who drive vehicles have seen their costs significantly increase, and I don't know that fares have kept pace with that. So I recognize it's an emergency. I know that the 
early discussions where skills games would be attached to that funding, but I, I don't believe that there'll be sufficient time to actually land an agreement on that prior That's, to the end of session. I'd like to welcome Representative Matt Bradford, House Majority Leader, to our discussion as well as we just uh, brought up the issue of transportation funding. Um, in a recent House Transportation Committee hearing, there were calls for additional funding. Do you see that happening before session ends? Yeah, I'm proud to report that the state, uh, the state House has twice passed the transit funding. Uh, we obviously are waiting on the Senate for action. Uh, at one point, they, as uh, the good minority leader mentioned, uh, wanted to tie it to skill games legislation. Uh, whether skill games legislation ever comes to pass, obviously it's never even gotten a, a committee vote in the Senate. Um, that was kind of the Senate's idea to tie the two. Our view is this is too important for workforce. Uh, this isn't too important for our business. Uh, frankly, this is an economic driver. The impact on our economy throughout the Commonwealth would be catastrophic. If you talk about the type of cuts in terms of route and ridership that would be necessary uh, to, to cut these budgets down to balance uh, for our transit agencies. And again, it's not just our urban areas. It's our rural areas. It's our seniors, people that rely on mass transit. Uh, so we're hoping that the Chamber of Commerce uh, can really uh, explain to our friends in the Senate that this is uh, no longer a, a want to have. This needs to get done. Uh, the minority leader is completely correct. We are running out of days and we need to move and pass that funding uh, yesterday. Can you remind our viewers how mass transit fared during the state budget process in early July and what additional funding is being requested or considered right now? Yeah, le leading up to the budget, the House had passed uh, the, uh, the sales tax offset, which mm -hmm. basically would not have raised taxes, but would have used some of the existing uh, fund balance that we have to fund SEPTA as well as the other transit agencies across the state. Uh, at that time, there wasn't an appetite. The Senate wanted to tie it to skilled games legislation. Uh, they've, to date, not been able to pass the skilled games. We passed a short-term patch. It was about $80 million. In fact, we matched it with uh, roads and bridge money, which I think there's bipartisan support for. Uh, so we did transit and transportation at the same time, gave them about six months infusion. Uh, that patch is about to wear out, uh, and we need to look for a long-term solution. And again, I, I think the... Uh, uh, my good friend from Lancaster is 100% right. At the same time we're doing transit, we should look at transportation. Our roads and bridge folks, these are huge economic drivers. The, the opportunity to pull down from the federal government some of the money that exists from the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill that uh, was passed by President Biden, we have a tremendous opportunity to, to leverage that money to do more for the Commonwealth, and we should do it. You, a moment ago, you just mentioned the uh, Governor Shapiro had proposed earmarking 1.75% of the sales tax to uh, divert that toward mass transit funding. If that were to pass and move through, what programs or uh, what other uh, recipients of that funding would that be diverted from? So right now it's from fund balance. We have about a $14 billion fund balance. Uh, so this would be a negligible impact on our budget. Again, uh, our Senate colleagues though did ask for a, an offset, a pay for, and we were more than willing to have that discussion. Uh, we've been waiting since March to get a skill games uh, piece of legislation over from the Senate. Um, they've been unable to do that for their own political dynamics. Uh, our view is, hey, if the Senate can't get this done, let's make sure that the businesses of Pennsylvania aren't impacted by losing the workforce uh, that's going to be impacted by this. So if, if the Senate can't get that done, let's make sure that uh, we hold harmless the businesses and the employees of Pennsylvania who need uh, transit in order to get to work. Does the House Republican Caucus um, have support for increasing funding for mass transit? No. Regarding the current plan, I think it's important. I know uh, Leader Bradford mentioned the $14 billion, but we have to understand where that $14 billion is. More than half of that's in the rainy day fund. And if we stay on our current trajectory, uh, what cash surplus that we had worked to increase uh, through the last decade, really, uh, you know, specifically with Governor Wolf in the first year of Governor Shapiro, um, that burn rate's substantial, uh, and we're projected to run out of money in the next year or two in regards to our, our cash flow surplus. So that's challenging. So we, we have to make sure that the long-term proposals are sustainable, unfortunately, uh, and there was minimal support uh, from House Republicans on that proposal because of the lack of sustainability. And I think we have to have a real discussion, as, as Leader Bradford said, regarding not just mass transit, but all transportation, roads, bridges, and mass transit. Uh, and, you know, big solutions uh, will take some hard work and some bipartisan delivery, and to date I just haven't seen that, that effort, and that's unfortunate. Are there any specific uh, solutions or proposals that your caucus would like to offer or that they would support to, to make more transportation funding palatable? Well, I, in terms of transportation funding, I know that, and uh, this really gets into 
one of the things that, and we've said this many times, you know, oftentimes we agree what the problems are and where we disagree is the solutions. Uh, and one of the proposals, you know, was to actually lower the gas tax and use the sales tax for vehicles at one point. Uh, one of our members proposed that. And that would have a substantial impact, uh, but it would raise the same questions that, that you just raised, which was what other programs would miss out. The sustainability problem is the real issue going forward. At our current burn rate, we're clearly looking at tax increases in the next year or two, uh, absent, you know, some large economical change, and I just don't see that on the horizon given the impacts of inflation. Uh, the, the cost, energy itself, it really drives a lot of this because energy, you know, obviously is in our fuel costs, it's in our raw materials costs, you know, with our asphalt, and then to deliver those materials, and steel has went up substantially as well. All of those issues uh, are impacting how far our dollars go, and each year, and I think you would agree, Matt, they go they go less far, and that's that's the challenge. So we have to have a, a comprehensive discussion, and I think that will probably involve a little bit of all the above in terms of how do you, you know, work the, the different funding streams, you know, maybe it is a discussion of sales tax being used for something. Uh, I know that the fuel tax, uh, there is an interest in lowering that in our caucus uh, because, you know, it was supposed to be a decade of improvements, and, you know, we're outside that decade window now. So. You know, what does that look like? But you can't simply cut the funding away because uh, while we've made improvements on our, our deficient bridges, there's still thousands that need done, and we have to pay those bills. That's one of the things that we've consistently uh, argued is that we have to be responsible with the money we have today and actually pay our bills, uh, preferentially do that instead of creating new programs or new expenses that just continue to add to the top line spending. Representative Bradford, would you like to follow up at all on how to proceed and move forward with transportation funding? The only thing I would say is just doing nothing as an alternative, and that patch that we passed is about to end at the end of this year. Um, so that's the real problem. I, yep. I'm more than willing to have a discussion. We've more than willing want to have a conversation about roads and bridges as well while we're doing transit, um, but this is imminent. This is going to have a crushing impact on our economy, uh, and this is pound uh, penny wise, pound foolish. The idea that we're going to say, oh, well, in these out years, using a $14 billion, now I, I disagree with the view of how long a $14 billion surplus will uh, stick with us. That's pretty massive in, in terms of where the Commonwealth is. We've never had these type of surpluses before, and, and Governor Shapiro is to be lauded for that. But having said that, um, the idea that we're going to let a challenge of four or five years ago, which we need to get more competitive as a commonwealth, and, and we're happy to have those discussions, um, but the idea that we're going to let ourselves go off the economic cliff in the next few uh, weeks and months because we failed to fund uh, mass transit and SEPTA and really hurt our businesses and our service industry, our workers, uh, our employees, it'll just be devastating. It is truly nonsensical that we find ourselves at this place at this time, uh, and I think, you know, we wait on the Senate to take action. Now, the two of you both alluded to the Senate proposal to pair skills gains taxation with transportation funding. So I want to talk about skills gains just briefly. For those that are not familiar, how do skills gains differ from the, the traditional casino, perhaps slot machine games, that you see at uh, the regular licensed Pennsylvania casinos? Well, that's a good question. You have two attorneys here, so you'd and probably... It's currently being litigated. Yeah, you'd probably get three <laughs> answers. Uh, that, that is a question of, uh, of legality um, that is really at the heart of the, the court case that's ongoing. Uh, listen, I think we all recognize the... Uh, just the, this flourishing of these skill games machines that you're seeing, not just in the convenience stores, but you're seeing them all over, uh, present uh, unique challenges in terms of public safety, in terms of uh, the cannibalization of our, our lottery, as well as our uh, existing casinos. Um, we need to have a holistic conversation about all of this uh, and step back and say, hey, look, they're there. They do support our, some of our small businesses, and we want to be mindful of that. It is now a revenue source for many of them. Um, but we need to rationalize and make reasonable this whole approach. That involves a taxation level, that involves an enforcement level, licensing. Um, you know, we can turn a blind eye to it like we have chosen to do with marijuana in the Commonwealth uh, and let these things go on in a gray market, which we all know is going on, uh, but we don't have the benefit of, uh, of uh, law enforcement or taxation or any of the, uh, of the goods that could come uh, by more securing this, uh, this, this form of commerce. Um, 
So regardless of where people stand on the legality of these individual machines, uh, we need to stop putting our head in the sand. The House told the Senate, because they tied it to transit, that we would defer to them, that I've said many times I'm agnostic on how that solution looks like. We've been waiting on the Senate to deliver a skill games bill. Uh, that's why the fact that they're inextricably linked to transit for some in the Senate is such a head scratcher for those of us in the House, because uh, frankly, the Senate's been unable to move on the skill games, has been unable to move on transit. Yeah, I think when you look at the skill games issue, the question really comes down to where the random number generator is. And that's been the legal question that's been litigated extensively. I think that the skill games folks have won eight or nine cases now uh, that uh, their machines are essentially outside the definitions contained in our laws. Uh, so Leader Bradford's correct. It needs to be addressed on, you know, from a statutory proposal. What that looks like remains to be seen. Uh, I would really categorize everybody kind of as a third, a third, a third. A third uh, like the situation the way it is now. A third would outlaw them completely uh, because of the impacts in the lottery and casinos. And a third wants some middle ground solution, but even in there, there's further segmentation about what that would look like. Uh, so it's, it's certainly a challenging issue. Uh, I think that everybody acknowledges their impacts in the community, uh, both good and bad, and what that means at, in terms of, you know, taverns and laundromats and convenience stores and other locations. But uh, it's a big issue. It's one that our gaming law does not fully contemplate and that itself creates some challenges. So as we go forward on that, uh, it remains to be seen what that specific solution would be, but it certainly needs to be addressed. Where is the issue of school games in the courts and what specifically is being challenged right now? Well, the Supreme Court, I think, took the case they at They did, this point. and there, I, I, think, I think there's been eight or nine different actions where they were confiscated as illegal slot machines, but by definition, they don't meet the definition of slot machines uh, is really what the issue at hand is. Um, you know, a slot machine uses a random number generator at a different point in the process, and uh, that continues to be kind of the facts that they're arguing. And uh, we'll see what the court ultimately does. Um, my guess is they probably take it back to us to define it. I'd like to shift our focus a little bit now and talk about hospital staffing bills. Um, since the beginning of session over a year ago, the House had passed uh, several pieces of legislation. Um, some of them included caps on nurse to patient ratio, re requiring hospitals to publicly list prices for their procedures. Can you talk a little bit about recent Senate action on one of these bills regarding hospital mergers? Um, well, going back to the nurse sta staff ratio, obviously coming out of pandemic, uh, our nurses were on the most frontline worker there was. Uh, they did an amazing job, uh, but they are stretched thin. We don't have enough nurses. Uh, many of our health systems, to their credit, are desperately trying to find more nurses. But the reality is, it, in terms of quality of care, as well as just the uh, appropriateness of the care that's being provided, uh, as well as the impact on these nurses that are just being pulled in too many directions, we need more nurses, but we need uh, some real enforcement and some bites that's going to make some of these health systems that, frankly, uh, have, have not been as addressing of this concern as they need to be. Um, so we passed nurse staff ratio, we're proud to say. Um, one of the big issues is with all of the consolidations and the mergers. Um, some of them are necessary, but frankly, some of them have not been uh, helpful to these local communities. Um, some of the private equity interests that have gotten into the healthcare space are very problematic. Uh, you have the, a long history in Pennsylvania and frankly in our country of the nonprofit health system. Uh, that is no longer the case in many cases. It's these giant uh, conglomerates that are much larger that people don't feel are necessarily listening to them and feel almost like they are for profit even if at the highest levels they maintain their nonprofit basis. Uh, but when you see CEOs making literally hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, it's hard to defend that. And again, going back to the nurse staff ratio type thing, when you see nurses spread too thin, not paying enough, when you see the frontline worker not sharing in the benefit, and you feel like the community says, that's no longer my local, um, that's no longer my local hospital, that doesn't feel like a nonprofit anymore. One of the very real problems with the nurse staff ratio issue is that not all hospitals are the same. And I know that sounds probably overly simplistic, but you know, having been a former healthcare practitioner myself, uh, I can tell you as an x-ray tech, um, I worked at you know, level two trauma centers where we took care of very severely injured patients. And I will tell you that an ICU patient at Lancaster General where I used to work is not the same as an ICU patient necessarily, you know, say at 
another hospital that I used to work at, which was Jennersville. Uh, that's no, no longer even a hospital. Uh, it had recently closed uh, because of you know some other challenges in the local community there. And, uh, while Christiana Care is looking to reopen it, it's going to be a long path. But bottom line is their units were different. So for us to say at the state level here in Harrisburg, you know, an ICU unit should have this number of patient ratio gets to be somewhat problematic because their ICU patient might actually be a step down unit in, a, you know, a more, um, you know, trauma level one or two center. And, and that's the challenge. Um, you know, many units actually do staffing uh, based on, uh, you know, their needs, you know, or their actual um, you know, patient acuity. And that I think is best for patients. Uh, I think that we both have the same goals in, in mind, which is we got to take care of the patients and make sure they're getting the care that they need. Uh, and what that looks like will be different, whether it's up in you know, Jersey Shore or whether it's in Cowdersport at Charles Cole Memorial versus you know a trauma center in Center City, Philly. Um, you know, I think that we can provide some guidelines, uh, but most importantly, I think we need to actually provide funding. Uh, one of the reasons that health systems continue to struggle is that government funded insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, chronically underfund the actual cost of services provided. And because of that, those who self-pay, uh, like the plain sec communities in the 100th district, or those who have third-party insurance, like many employers, or those who self-insure end up actually paying more. Uh, and you know, when we look at Medicaid rates, they've not been increased substantially in some time. We need to have a real discussion about that. We had targeted increases for the nursing homes, I think it was two years ago, and ambulance providers recently, but more needs to be done in that area. Because if we provide the funding, I think it does lend itself uh, to paying you know, staff higher wages and then ensuring proper levels of staff. But it does not address the pipeline issue. Uh, we need to come up with, and I was glad to see on the House calendar, you know, some of the the scope of practice, and I use that term loosely, like the certified medical assistants being able to provide medication in nursing homes and LPNs having slightly increased duties. You know, we can make some policy changes at the state level in the licensure world, but we still have to get people into those areas. And one of the things, and it's encouraged me as we've seen more recently kind of these pathways where you can come in as a nurse's aide, become an LPN, become an RN. Um, and my wife, I'll use her as an example, that's exactly the path she took. She went from an LPN to an RN to a BSN to a master's and now she's in her doctorate program. So it, to the extent that we can encourage that at the state level, we'll get the advanced care practitioners that we need, but then we'll also have a constant flow of incoming people who are generally interested in the healthcare field. I did that myself as an x-ray tech. I was a, you you know, as a tech aide was what we were classified as. And then while I was in x-ray school, I worked, but also went to school. And learning a trade, you know, that actually increases uh, our skill sets, but then it also decreases our debt load, which is hugely important. So I think that there's some solutions there, and it's my hope that in the next budget, uh, we can have a serious discussion about Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates to the healthcare facilities. Have you ever gotten any indication from Senate leaders um, as to whether any of these hospital staffing uh, related bills will move forward before end of session? We have pushed, uh, even in this late day, we are still trying to push out some deals to get some of this legislation. Uh, the staff ratio bill, I'm proud to say, had, you know, I think 30 Republicans who supported that. Uh, it was pretty overwhelmingly bipartisan, so I'm hoping uh, that that will clue the Senate in that there's uh, broad support. And I, I would thank uh, Representative Mahaffey and Tomlinson, who actually uh, were two of the uh, Republicans who led the way on that, which is really uh, uh, emblematic of how we've been able to push bipartisan bills like that over. I would also say, uh, you mentioned the issue of billing transparency. That's another area. Uh, you know, we had the uh, the Koch brothers arguing for that. Uh, that, if nothing else, shows the pragmatism of this House majority where we've said, hey, that makes sense. We need to rationalize the costs of health care, make it more transparent, more obvious. Um, and we were able to get that uh, over. We're also waiting for the Senate to move on that. We're going to give our guests a brief break. I will continue our discussion in just a moment, but first let's look at what's coming up on PCN. We want you to meet the candidates whose names appear on the ballot in November. Our series of interviews features the hopefuls running for U.S. Senate, Congress, and state row offices. Candidate interviews air Wednesdays at 7 p.m. To find out who's being featured and the offices they're running for, visit PCN Select or PCNTV.com. The Democratic State Committee hosted their Independence Dinner with Governor Josh Shapiro in attendance that airs on PCN Thursday at 1 p.m.
Journalist Roundtable returns with Stephen Caruso from Spotlight PA, Jillian McGoldrick from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and Taylor Millard from the Delaware Valley Journal. That airs Thursday at 7 p.m. Football game of the week here on PCN, Central Mountain versus Mount Carmel. The action starts Friday live at 7 p.m. The public affairs coverage you watch on PCN TV is now free online. Go to PCNTV.com and check out our streaming service, PCN Select. PCN is a 501c3 nonprofit television network. We rely on viewers and donors like you to help PCN bring you everything Pennsylvania. To make a donation, visit PCNTV.com. Now, as we get back into our discussion with House leaders, uh, we're less than a month away from the election. I want to talk a little bit about election law. First of all, county government has been calling for pre-canvassing for a number of years now. Uh, Representative Bradford, if you could explain briefly what is pre-canvassing and what is the likelihood of this moving forward anytime uh, in the near future? I, uh, like any good baseball fan, spring, uh, what is it, hope springs eternal? Mm -hmm. Uh, let me tell you, uh, the fact that we've not been able to get this over the finish line is deplorable and despicable. Um, this is a simple thing that goes on in every, almost every state, blue or red state. Uh, I was listening to Governor DeSantis in Florida talk about how efficient they've gotten in terms of processing elections. It's the simple idea with mail-in ballots uh, that prior to Election Day, right now at 7 a.m. is the first time that our counties are able to open the outside of the envelope get the, uh, I guess, to the secrecy envelope, make sure that it's, you know, it's Matt Bradford voted, okay, they can't vote on election day that way, literally scan the barcode in, process it, have everything ready to go, not count votes, literally do all of the backup stuff, the back office stuff that allows them on election day to put all those, you know, unfold them, put them into the machine, and then have that scantron shoot out. So frankly, that at 8 p.m., not only people know that there's an accurate count, but there's a timely count. Uh, we all remember with horror what happened uh, after the last election uh, because we weren't able to get timely counts. Uh, we have an obligation, regardless of political party, regardless of what candidate we support, to make sure people have confidence in their election. There are those uh, darker angels that would sow division and doubt in our elections out there. Uh, they are wrong to do that. Pre-canvassing helps cut some of that off at the pass. We should have passed it. The House has passed it numerous times. Uh, I hope that the Senate will take it up. Even at this late date, it would be a huge tool in terms of restoring confidence and giving counties the ability uh, to administer a timely, fair, and accurate election. Yeah, pre-canvassing, as Leader Bradford pointed out, has passed the House several times. Um, and in fact, it actually landed on Governor Wolf's desk and he vetoed it. And it's unfortunate because it, it was, uh, as Matt said, it, it's a solution that I think would actually help. Now, I will say that I think our counties have become much more efficient in terms of processing the ballots. I actually got, in my most recent primary, I got the mail-in results before I got any of my local precinct results reported. So I think that as they've made improvements there, um, that's good. Uh, but, you know, the bottom line is, is there's still plenty of room for reform. And I think that, um, you know, I think overall mail-in ballot requests are down this cycle as compared to four years ago. Uh, so I think that also will, will assist the counties in making the you know, the, the pre-work followed by the county, because the machines themselves can count tens of thousands of ballots per hour. So it's not the counting that actually takes all the time. It's the the opening both envelopes and then unfolding the ballot and then, you know, running all that through the process. So I wish Governor Wolf had signed House Bill 1300, but he didn't. And uh, so we're still stuck trying to find a solution in that world. Representative Cutler, if I could circle back to you, you and members of your caucus have talked a lot recently about double voting. Can you explain what is double voting and how did this come to your attention? Sure. Well, there was recently a case in Montgomery County where an individual was convicted and, and ultimately uh, found guilty of voting twice. And not only did he vote in different counties at different times here in Pennsylvania, he also voted in different states. One of the challenges is uh, many of our neighbors and uh, many of the larger, more populous states, particularly Florida, uh, for example, where we have a lot of people the snowbird. Uh, there really is no standardized data collection and there's really no comparison. Uh, ERIC uh, had been a system that was supposed to do that, but only a portion of the states participated. So it does open up the possibility that you could live somewhere uh, and say go to school somewhere or winter somewhere and actually be registered in both places. Uh, I think it's real important. One person, one vote, one time. That's our goal. And uh, to the extent that there's any kind of duplication or, you know, fraud that does occur uh, this, and I want to make it very clear, the State Department doesn't say that it never happens, it says that it's rare. Uh, it should never happen. 
and that should really be our end goal. I think there's a couple easy fixes, and it's my hope that could be included in any kind of election discussions going forward. Standardized date fields amongst our counties. Uh, our, all of our counties use different uh, date fields right now uh, and data fields. Uh, Ohio, for example, is completely standardized. That was the, the databases. It was all publicly available. The representative Flick had pulled from. And you know, found a series of, you know, perfect name matches plus birthdays. So I know that they're, they've reached out to the Attorney General and they will look at that. I know that the case was recently prosecuted in Montgomery County, uh, but we should go from rare to never. And that's really ultimately our goal. Do you see this as an argument for voter ID? Uh, it, obviously, I've argued for voter ID and voted for it multiple times. I think that there is a possibility, um, you know, that that would, would help. Uh, but it will only help to the extent that the other states or the, you know, outside of Pennsylvania, if it's multi-state as opposed to multi-county, uh, that would be very important uh, because you'd have to make sure that the databases are being compared in every state uh, because, unfortunately, people, you know, they can live six months in one day at one place, that's your legal residence. The minus one day from six months is your other, but, you know, if you go to school there or winter there or work there part-time, you know, that's the challenge that's presented. So uh, it shouldn't be a hard fix. We can track packages from Amazon. We track our mail-in ballots now in the current system. You know when they're sent, you know when they're received, you know when they're processed. It seems to me we should be able to track the voters too, but voter ID would certainly be a big help. Representative Bradford, would you like to comment on that? Absolutely. Uh, anyone who engages in fraud should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, period, full stop, Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. Um, unfortunately, I think people have used these kind of uh, outliers and, and listen, r rare is not never and, and never should be the goal. Um, but there are those, unfortunately, those darker angels who want to use these as, as uh, an excuse to create a voter ID that would actually disenfranchise voters. Listen, if there's a voter ID that won't turn away a single voter in terms of their rightful obligation and, and frankly, uh, right to vote, uh, you'll have 100% support. I've supported those measures in the past and can again. Um, but I think we need to have a rational discussion about elections. We remember what happened on uh, four years ago and, and January 6th thereafter. Um, it's hard to have an honest discussion with folks about elections when there is so much um, turmoil and there are those pouring gas on this issue. Um, we need to have an honest discussion. Listen, I remember, uh, and, and as I know Representative Fleck, and I, I very much look forward to hearing what uh, comes from his report, uh, but I remember we had a gentleman who I like very much who was from Lebanon County who said there was a quarter of a million, a quarter of a million ballots that were uh, wrongly cast in the last election. And when the scrutiny came upon that House member's uh, research, it didn't hold water. Um, so I think we need to be leery, cautious, careful uh, when we hear these claims of double voting and these dubious claims of these rampant fraud allegations. We're 30 days from a very important election. Regardless of who wins, we need to make sure people have confidence in it. And sowing the seeds of doubt, I think, has done uh, real damage to our democracy in the past, and I don't want us to make that mistake again. Well, to be clear, I don't think it's dubious. We have a case from... Leader Bradford's home county uh, that's very real. And I agree that never should be the goal. Uh, but the reality is, is we actually need to start legislating voter laws and stop uh, litigating, which is really what's happening. I was actually pleased to see the Supreme Court for once not take action on a case because it was too close to the election. Uh, I think that their, you know, meddling and changing of the rules is a real problem that equally cast out on, you know, the outcomes in terms of you know, which votes should be counted, shouldn't be counted. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago, it was four years ago that the Supreme Court said, you know, even though the law is very clear, eight o'clock on election night, the ballots have to be in, uh, they extended the deadline to receive the mail-ins for three days after. And now, granted, that was 9,500 ballots. We had them segregated uh, subsequent to a court order. And, you know, they roughly broke out you know, the way that the rest of the mail-ins did, but the, and it would not have impacted the total tally, which was about 81,000 vote difference. But the fact that the law wasn't followed and it, there was a special allowance in one time, uh, that equally causes questions. Uh, so I'm glad that the court did intervene this time, and I think it's time that we actually get to legislating. Let's shift our focus now and talk briefly about school vouchers. An article that appeared in Spotlight PA yesterday said 53% of Pennsylvanians don't support using taxpayer dollars to fund school vouchers. Is there political in the legislature to revisit this issue? 
So I don't think vouchers are a good idea, period, full stop. I don't think most people support the idea of using taxpayer dollars directly to fund private schools, private schools that can discriminate, that don't have to take every child, uh, and the voucher in many cases won't be sufficient to pay for full tuition. Um, and listen, I don't fully agree with where my governor of my own party is on that, but I will tell you, uh, I've sat down and talked to my governor about this on many occasions. Uh, there are those of us that are willing to compromise. We have a very uh, a robust tax credit program in the Commonwealth, the EITC program. Listen, if you want to target more dollars for poor kids and poor schools and more alternatives for those kids, uh, House Democrats will be there all the way. Uh, we've made historic uh, educational uh, funding improvements per the Commonwealth Court ruling for our public schools this year. Uh, we have an obligation to make sure we do that for the next eight or nine budget years, and we're going to do that. Um, but if you want to have a conversation about expanding tax credit programs, specifically targeting the poorest kids and poorest schools, um, that is a very different discussion from a voucher program. Uh, too often this becomes too much of a black and white litmus test. Um, it's not for many of us. We are a pragmatic group. We understand. Uh, but the polling today and the Spotlight article again generates that there is no support for diverting taxpayer dollars to private schools at the expense of our public schools and our public property taxpayers. Um, look, I'm going to open this with I attended a public school. All three of my kids attended the same public school. We're very fortunate that we have a good public school that really works on those pathways uh, that I referenced earlier, you know, from the bottom up in terms of the trades. However, I also recognize that not every student has those same opportunities. The truth is we have some schools, uh, both public and private, that simply aren't meeting the goals that, that we have or the standards that we have. Uh, we have individuals who can't read on grade level. You know, we have some schools and some systems where an entire building, nobody's on grade level. We should not doom a child uh, to be stuck in that system by virtue of their zip code. Uh, that's actually an area where I do agree with our governor uh, on that issue regarding, you know, giving those kids a choice. Uh, that's why I've advocated for both the EITC and the OSTC program, which specifically targets the lower income and those that are in, in very challenging school districts because everybody deserves to have an opportunity and that opportunity will be different because we all learn different. Uh, myself, I happen to be a hands-on learner. Um, I was not a good traditional student and uh, that comes as a surprise to a lot of folks, uh, including some of my teachers. But you know, I had the opportunity to actually share my report cards that my mom, uh, God bless her soul, had kept and some of the comments that they had written and it was clear, I did not do well in a standard environment. I didn't work well with others. Uh, maybe Leader Bradford would say that's still the case, I don't know. But the truth, the, the truth is, uh, the truth is, you know, uh, that environment, while I was ultimately able to succeed, it might not have been the best for me. So I do think that whatever that opportunity is, uh, I think that we should have those discussions. I'm, I'm heartened to hear uh, the support of a, a possibility of a compromise. But I also think we have to have a real discussion about not sending every individual to college, uh, like myself, who went to trade school first. I think that's an area that we had worked with Governor Wolf on previously. And quite frankly, I think it helps our workforces. And it's something that we need to, you know, we need to have that discussion and say, look, there's some great trades, there's some great opportunities, there's some great skills that you can learn long before you graduate high school that would make you uh, very, uh, you know, fully employed when you when you graduate. And we've we've increased those opportunities regarding uh, some of the, the trade schools and the opportunities, but the work's not done yet uh, because we we need to be in a position to allow every child to succeed, every student to succeed, and that answer is not always money. Uh, sometimes it's just a different environment. Um, one other topic before we run out of time. Uh, in the last month, Representatives Coffer and Kincaid offered a bipartisan bill that would legalize recreational marijuana. This has been a perennial issue in recent years. Is there will in the House to pass and move this forward? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure about that particular bill. Uh, but uh, we've been talking about it. The simple reality is every one of our surrounding states are going to have legalized adult use. Uh, the state is already awash in uh, the illegal form. Uh, so the idea that we can regulate and set up a, a structure uh, administratively from a taxation and enforcement and making sure that children aren't getting in it, that it's in the right places at the right time, uh, that is something we can absolutely accomplish. Uh, obviously, we're going to need buy-in from our friends in the Senate. Uh, they're of a different party and of a different mindset on the issue. Uh, we saw how hard it was to get uh, medical done in the Commonwealth. 
Uh, this obviously moves us to where most of our states are. Frankly, Ohio, some of our most conservative border states have already done it by voter referendum. Um, we're going to need to obviously uh, continue to control the House as well as uh, potentially see a change in the, the makeup of the Senate in order to get it over the finish line. Is there support in the Republican caucus? What I've consistently heard from many of my colleagues is they'd like for the medical program to be fully operational and fix many of the deficiencies that are currently contained there. You can go back to my speech on uh, the medical program, and I raised several issues regarding firearm ownership, insurance, prescriptive authority, workers' comp, and uh, employment issues uh, that would all arise. And unfortunately, we've seen all of those come up uh, where, you know, people were surprised to learn that, you know, the questions on the federal forms to buy a gun or unemployment law the way that it is, it is currently written causes some issues uh, for people who think that they're legal under the state program but may in fact still uh, lose some benefits elsewhere. And uh, the other big component that I've consistently heard from some of the biggest advocates for the medical program is the, the slow uptake regarding the research licenses and some of the litigation that's being uh, ongoing there. Uh, so there's a, a strong desire to make sure that that one's operating the way that it should prior to any discussions of further expansion. There were only roughly about seven session days left before the House and Senate wrap up at the end of November. What do you think will get accomplished between now and then? Well, I always say in this job that there's no shortage of problems. Um, and it's not like if we fix a problem that we suddenly will no longer have discuss. Uh, but unfortunately, given kind of the political nature of the timing as we head to the election, um, you know, while I wish that transportation and public safety and, you know, the, some of the election reforms uh, would all be resolved, uh, at a minimum, I think we have to do the utility laws, Chapter 14, and whatever that solution looks like. Uh, I personally support the Senate version that came over. I know that we've worked on a different version in the House. Uh, you know, so that needs to be resolved. That's the end of the year. I think there's some movement on uh, the 988 line and, and uh, you know, some of the issues there uh, regarding some of the awareness. Um, so I think that we'll get some things done. Uh, and I think there'll be agreement on what needs to get done, uh, but maybe the solutions are a little bit different in terms of what each side offers. Representative Bradford, I'll give you the last word. There's some big things that we would still like to get over. Uh, Brian's 100% right, there are some of those smaller deals we get done, but uh, for me personally, uh, getting statute of limitations reform to finally deliver justice for our uh, child victims of sexual abuse, uh, that's over in the Senate. We are pragmatic as hell and willing to make a deal on that. We'd love to get that done. Minimum wage, uh, getting a minimum wage increase, uh, earned income tax credit, we would love to get that done finally, give people relief as they deal with the higher costs to make sure that we do that. Um, as well as transit and making sure that our businesses can get uh, both uh, their employees and their uh, customers to market. So I think there's some big things too. Again, it's going to require a lot of trading, uh, but we are more than uh, willing to make those trades. Representatives Bradford, Cutler, gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. PCN spoke with Representative Kathy Rapp about the Rural Health Care Grant Program. Representative Kathy Rapp, welcome to our program. You've introduced something known as the Rural Health Care Grant Program. Can you tell us about this program? Yes, and thank you very much for having me this morning. The Rural uh, Health Care Grant Program is legislation uh, for a grant program that would go to rural uh, entities and rural populated areas and rural counties and to hospitals that provide uh, services that are independent from our larger uh, conglomerate uh, hospitals uh, or hospitals that are affiliated with uh, larger hospitals that are independent community hospitals. These grants would be uh, uh, budgeted uh, for $250,000 per year, uh, given out at $10,000 uh, increments and uh, for uh, agreements between the Department of Health and the rural health entities for our physicians, our uh, nurses, uh, midwives and, and nurse midwives, so that there would be a an application from the hospital, or the health care healthcare entity, with the Department of Health, and uh, 
so that agreement would be established between the two uh, for these grants to be awarded. Now for a hospital to be considered rural, rural is a population of 284 person per square mile in a county. So there is criteria as to what is determined to be rural. And uh, as I said, it would, uh, uh, the grants would be to help pay down um, uh, tuition uh, for education, for physicians, for nurses, uh, uh, midwives and nurse midwives, that they, they, that would be paid in $10,000 increments. Um, and there was also, there would also be criteria, obviously, for uh, the recipients of those grants, uh, working requirement in the rural setting, uh, working for uh, a minimum um, a time span, I believe it's uh, three years. And let me see here, be licensed to practice uh, as a practitioner in the Commonwealth. They would have to begin uh, within six months of accepting a position uh, with the entity paying for the education debt and be employed as a full-time practitioner for the entity providing the grant. Uh, so the grants application uh, would be submitted to, submitted to Department of Health and if uh, they would be selected, then it would be determined, be determined by the Department of Health by the Department of Health, which entities would be selected for the grant. What inspired you to create this program? Well, we have um, a rural health uh, roundtable uh, um, um, leaders who come to Harrisburg and in other settings. And uh, we had uh, mostly rural hospitals uh, who come and attend these meetings and some of the ideas that they expressed, and I've talked to uh, my own um, CEO of, I'm from Warren, PA, and uh, mm -hmm. in Warren County. And uh, so many physicians uh, attend these meetings and talk about the barriers that people have, both providers and consumers in, in rural communities. And one of the issues as far as, uh, giving incentives to physicians and other caretakers to practice in rural counties. This was one of the solutions that was suggested that as we all know, I think uh, physicians have uh, a very heavy debt when they graduate. And so do nurses and, and anyone else uh, going to college is, uh, is, is expensive, the tuition and it takes many years to accomplish being a physician, no matter where you reside. So this uh, was brought forth as an incentive and, uh, for rural hospitals to be able to recruit doctors and others to practice in rural Pennsylvania, where we, if we're in settings where we don't have the urban and suburban entities uh, uh, that uh, people enjoy, say like in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, but there are other things that we offer. Uh, the great outdoors, hunting, fishing, canoeing, kayaking, and uh, low crime communities. And so this is a way basically for our hospitals to entice people to take a maybe a second look or consider practicing and being in a more rural community uh, and setting uh, where they can practice and have uh, some of their tuition paid for if they agree to practice in a, in a rural community. We have about a minute left, but in that last few minutes, uh, can you explain where this funding is coming from? I know you mentioned it's going towards these hospitals, but where exactly are we getting that money? Well, the money would uh, obviously be taken from uh, the general the general fund budget and be uh, placed in a in uh, Department of Health, uh, specifically 
held for uh, the grants for the hospitals. So this is done, you know, uh, for other organizations as well, but that money would be held in a special account, but it would be taken from the general fund uh, and put into an account at Department of Health. I do believe that this is a great way to help our rural citizens have access to rural, to healthcare and to have good uh, medical care in our rural communities so that they do not have to travel an hour and a half, two hours, three hours to go to uh, a large hospital like in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. They can have those same services in those small communities that they live in. And I know where I live, our hospital has been successful in recruiting doctors into Warren General. And this would just be another boost to be able to recruit doctors with uh, these incentives in helping pay off educational debt, doctors and other practitioners as well. Representative Kathy Rapp, thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes today's show. A reminder, we want you to meet the candidates whose names appear on the ballot in November. Our series of interviews features the hopefuls running for U.S. Senate, Congress, and state row offices. Candidate interviews air Wednesdays at 7 p.m. To find out who's being featured and the offices they're running for, visit PCN Select or PCNTV.com. I'm Scherzer. Thank you for watching.